Well, good morning and welcome to worship at Brentwood Baptist Church. You're used to seeing me beaming around on the video screens up there in the Countdown Worship video. So I just want to let you know this morning that I am a living, breathing person. I'm real. I'm here and delighted to see you all this morning. Uh, there's a communication card in the pew rack in front of you. And if you're our guest this morning, we want to offer you a special warm welcome and invite you to fill out that communication card as a record of your attendance with us. And also there's an opportunity on that card to list a prayer request. And we'd be honored to have our prayer team pray for you. This morning, Scott Harris, our missions minister, is going to be bringing our message, the most important conversation in the world. And we're also delighted to have the singing and songwriting and worship leading duo of Dick and Mel Tunney leading us in worship along with some of our own worship team. They have been serving the Christian music and worship community for many, many years, and they're also a part of our family of faith here at Brentwood Baptist Church, and we're delighted to have them leading us in worship today. Before they come, let's stand and greet one another, but as you do that, let me encourage you and invite you to come down a little closer. We're going to have a nice, cozy group today, so just come on down a little closer. Let's fill in some of these seats down front, shall we? that we just sang. It says, He rules the world with truth and grace, and He makes the nations prove the glories of His love and His, His righteousness and the wonders of His love. God is in control this morning. How many of you know that? He is sovereign. We hope that you have had a Merry Christmas. Many of you may have had a, a very joyful Christmas. Some of you this morning may be in, in a place where it wasn't such a Merry Christmas and you are in a place of needing to just trust and believe that God is sovereign and he is he is Lord of all amen amen God's Word says in Psalm 34 it says I will bless the Lord when at all times his praise will continually be in my mouth so let's bless him this morning let's sing this Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Pour out 
Second Chronicles, a very familiar passage. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and will pray and will seek my face and will turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That is our prayer this morning. Listen to this song. This is maybe a newer one for you. You'll pick it up very quickly, but listen to these words.
seat. Well, well, I'm glad that you're here this morning. Uh, I, I know that some of you, I, I want to echo what Mel said. I know some of you, your hearts are full because of what you experienced yesterday with family and friends. And I know for some of you, your, your prayer life started this morning with uh, just asking the Lord for safe passage out of your neighborhood um, and safe travel here. Uh, I, I, I certainly know of some people that I've been praying for this week and this morning. I, I know that they're just, they're probably praying, if, if I could guess what they're praying, that the Lord would just help get them through the day. Uh, and for some of them, it may be get me, and you may feel this way, it may be get, get me to, to just lunchtime. And then if you make it to noon, you pray to the Lord, see me through the evening. And if you make it through the evening, you pray, Lord, just give me the ability to make it through the morning again. So um, I want to echo that. I know that in these moments, as you come into worship this morning, some of us feel wonderful and our hearts are full and others, our hearts are breaking. And this is the perfect time for us to come together, not just individually, but corporately and pray for one another and talk to Jesus and talk to God the Father. And so that's what this moment is for. So if you're visiting with us, we consider ourselves blessed to have a high priest, Jesus Christ, who we can access directly and call upon His name. And so this morning during this time, you will see some people come down front uh, to kneel at the steps uh, to pray uh, with others or, or by themselves or wherever you're seated, wherever you feel most comfortable praying, just that you know you have that invitation. Uh, I do want to let you know uh, we're fortunate this morning to have a couple of our, our friends and missionary partners from Brentwood Baptist here with us this morning. Uh, Mike and Pam Talley are here this morning. Uh, they are just fresh off of a three-year stint in Cape Town, South Africa, where they have, have worked tirelessly to, to lay the infrastructure uh, for much of what Living Hope, our partner, is doing there as it pertains to teams and, and volunteers from the United States coming there. Uh, they're here finishing up that chapter of ministry, starting something new in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, so I, in just a minute, when, when I open the altar for prayer, I'm going to invite them to come join me uh, down here along with Scott Harris, our missions minister, and Danielle Schneider will also be here and will join us as well. And, and Danielle uh, is also a member here at Brentwood Baptist Church, and she has been a life skills educator and volunteer uh, in Cape Town for a couple years now and works with hundreds and now thousands of children uh, who do not have uh, anyone investing in their life much less sharing the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to invite Mike and Pam Talley and Danielle Schneider to come down here and, and join me. And, and if you feel led to come down here and pray or you want to pray with them, I encourage you to come down here uh, and, and, and lace a hand on their shoulder and pray for God's protection and wisdom and discernment upon them for the days ahead or wherever you are, just that you know you have this opportunity to pray. So as they come forward to join me, I want to invite you to come forward as well. Scott Harris will be down here to pray with them as well as he brings the message. If you feel led to come down and pray with him, please do that. But let's just pray together this morning.
God, we praise You for sending Your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world as an infant, as a child that we celebrated yesterday and today. In this season of the year, we, we praise You for placing upon Him our, our inadequacies and our brokenness and ultimately seeing Him go to the cross to reconcile us to You so that we could have the opportunity right now to call upon You and know that You, you identify with us and our emotions and our thoughts. And so I pray this morning, Lord, because of that, that Jesus, that You would comfort those who are hurting this morning. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would walk alongside of those who, they may not be hurting, they may not be happy, but they're just, they're confused. And Lord Jesus, for those of us who, who all as well, help, help us to, to keep our eyes fixed upon you. God, this morning we thank you for Mike, for Pam, and for Danielle, and we thank you for what we've been able to see you accomplish through them, and we pray that in the days and months ahead that you would continue to use them. And by the blood of the Lamb and the testimony of their mouth, Lord, we pray that they would overcome the enemy's schemes and anything he would do to put in their way to keep them from sharing the name of Jesus Christ with others. Lord, we pray this morning for Scott. We pray that you would fill his mouth with your words. Open the eyes and ears of our hearts to receive a message of hope that is found in the name of Jesus Christ. And for those who couldn't be with us this morning, for whatever reason, Lord Jesus, would you minister to them wherever they may be so that they may know that you love them and that you desire them to know you in a personal way. God, it's in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we pray these things. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship at Brentwood Baptist Church. I'm glad that you've chosen to be with us on this day after Christmas, and I hope your Christmas season was all that you wanted it to be. Jean and I will be away for a few days. We're going to South Carolina to spend some time with her family. As you may remember, Jeannie lost her father back in July, and this is the first Christmas season that we will be going through without her father, Jean Powers. You know, for a lot of you, this is the first Christmas that you have been through without somebody that you love. So I know that even with all of the celebration of joy, there's a tinge of sadness. I want you to know that we're aware of this, and we're praying for you even as I record this. Now, while we're away, Scott Harris, our Minister of Missions, will be bringing the message this morning. You know, the good news of Christ coming into our world is why we do evangelism. We want everyone to know that Jesus has come. The most effective way we do this is through our missions ministry and, and all of our partners that Scott Harris works with. Scott Harris will be bringing our message now, and I know he's been eager to preach. I know you'll be eager to hear the word that God will bring through him this morning. So give Scott your full attention, and Gina and I will see you next year. Well, let me tell you, it's really good to see you. As I was driving in today, I thought, you know what? We could have a little Bible study right here if we need to. Man, it is really good to see you. Raise your hand. Is uh, this your first ever white Christmas? My first white Christmas. First Christmas my wife and I and children have ever had in our own home. And uh, what a way to celebrate the birth of Christ with that fresh dusting of snow. Have you ever gone somewhere on a one-way ticket? You know, most of us when we travel, we make sure we have a round-trip ticket. Well, when we were praying for Mike and Pam Talley and Danielle Schneider, you know, when they were sent out from our church, we told them, just get a one-way ticket. They weren't going on a mission journey where they would come back in a week or two. We didn't have all the funds in the bank that they needed at the time, but we said the people of Brentwood Baptist Church are going to be faithful. And so when Danielle and the Tallies left here some years ago to plant their lives in another place, we bought them a one-way ticket. 
Because in confidence, we knew that God would provide what they needed to stay there and to plant their lives. And so as the offering is being taken, remember, folks, that we are all about sending people away. One-way tickets to go to the corners of the earth and to tell the good news of the Christmas story that what you celebrated yesterday is not just for you and you alone and it's not just for your family. It indeed is for all peoples in this world. And your generosity ongoing makes sure that yes, we have what's needed to keep the lights on and the parking lots cleared. But we also have what is needed to support the men and women who serve faithfully here in our own community. I see Daryl Murray and his family. Daryl started Welcome Home Ministries that provides a place for men recovering from addictions to, to get their life right and to grow in their walk with Christ. Many of these brothers in Christ come to Brentwood Baptist. We support that ministry through the Hope for the World offering. Danielle's going back to South Africa. Why? Because you give. In your bulletin today, we have some special information about our missions ministry partners. Talks about what we've done in the flood this year. What we've done with Haiti. Where the money goes for hope for the world. So as our ushers come forward, Pray at this end of the year that you will give generously to the church, to its budget needs and in the white envelope, but that you would also remember to give to our mission causes around the world. Jesus and his message are worth it. So as the offering is being taken, take a look and see some of the ways that we are spreading hope for the world. Would you pray with me? Father, indeed, our only hope is you. Father, thank you for the ability to buy one-way tickets in faith and confidence that you will move in your people. Thank you for the lives that have been forever changed. Thank you for the thousands that have been introduced to Jesus Christ because of what you've invited us to do. So take these offerings. Father, bless them. Multiply them. For it is all for your glory and your glory alone. In the name of the Christ child and the risen Christ we pray. Amen. see there where it says that the giving goal this year is 750,000 and to date and it is you know December 26 and gifts are received through the end of the year we're at 484 and before you panic 
Listen, Brentwood Baptist Church has always been faithful. And the last week of the year is always where we get a huge shot in the arm. So join me this week in praying that our people will respond. It's been a tough few years. You know it and I know it. And in the last few years, we've not been able to make our offering. In fact, if we make our offering this year, it'll be the first time since 2006. So pray that our people will respond so we can keep sending people on one-way tickets and our local partners like Siloam and GraceWorks as well. Thank you, thank you for your faithfulness. It is indeed an honor to be with you and, and today we are going to take a step back in time and we are going to be a fly on the wall, so to speak, and we are gonna overhear the most important conversation in the world. And it's not only the most important conversation that Peter ever had or that the disciples ever listened to, it is also echoing the most important conversation that you have ever had. If you're a Christian here today, if you come here today as a brother and sister in Christ, then, then you have already had this conversation in a sense. It is past, and yet... As a disciple of Christ, you have this conversation on an ongoing basis. It might not go exactly like this. It might not have the same words. But every day, the choices that you make, how you live your life, what you confess with your mouth, you are either agreeing with this original conversation or you are writing a different narrative to your story. And if you are not a believer here today, then this indeed is the conversation that is waiting to happen. This is the conversation that you were born to have. This is the conversation that is your destiny. And why would you not be willing to at least engage in a conversation? A conversation by definition is not a monologue. A conversation is a dialogue, and you see this interplay between Jesus and Peter and the other disciples, and because of this particular conversation, that is why, in many ways, you and I are here today. This is a conversation that we're about to read that enabled you to hear the words of life and enabled you to have this conversation for yourself. So if you would, would you please stand with me as we read Matthew chapter 16. Now in your pew Bibles, it's page 972. And when we're finished reading, keep your Bibles open because we're going to be referring to these verses. And as I read, put yourself in this time and place. And what would have been your role and your contribution to this conversation? Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 24. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, 
Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let's pray together. Father, may these words uttered and recorded thousands of years ago resonate in our hearts and minds in new and fresh ways as we say goodbye to a year, as we say hello to a new year. Father, may this be the most important conversation that we ever have with you. And may you so sear it on our hearts that it is the most important conversation that we wish to have with other people as well. Father, thank you for talking with us. Thank you for inviting us into this holy conversation. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I don't know if you can tell from here, but the tie I have is not only a loud shade of orange, it also has palm trees on it. I have faith that the snow will melt and that warm weather will return again, but I'm in no hurry because there's something about the quiet of the holiday and the quiet of the snow that, that, that makes us somewhat reflective and, and introspective. And I hope that you come here this morning eager and willing and able to continue the conversation that Jesus has started with you or to begin it afresh and anew. And I'm confident that we have more people than usual watching online from home. And I pray that even where you are, the Spirit will speak and the Spirit will have his way with all of us. And so here we are in Matthew chapter 16. At this point, Jesus has been with his disciples for a good two and a half years. They've been watching, he's been teaching, they've been responding. They've not only been watching him, they've been watching other people's reaction to him. Early on in his ministry, there seemed to be this awareness that, that, that Jesus might be the Messiah, but in the ensuing months and years, the disciples had become more fearful. They seemed to be a little uncertain. Jesus knows that his time on earth is coming to an end, and so he not only takes a survey here in Matthew chapter 16, he is preparing them for some hard truths because as challenging as life has been for them in the last two and a half years, it's about to get a lot more challenging. And so, in a sense, Jesus begins to show his hand to the disciples. And what's important here is not only the questions that Jesus asks the disciples, but it's important to note where he asks this. Now, when you and I read this and we see the word Caesarea Philippi, we're like, hey, it's some village in Israel. But for the reader back then and for the disciples back then, they would have understood the strategic importance of Jesus having this conversation with the disciples in this particular place. Caesarea Philippi was at the very northern edge of the Jewish nation. It was a center of pagan worship. Fourteen temples to the god of Baal alone. The original name of Caesarea Philippi, don't know how to pronounce it, Panias, I think, was named after the Greek god Pan, the god of music. You've heard of the word pantheistic, the belief in, in, in many gods. And so this was a place that was uncomfortable for good, righteous Jews. They were not cloistered or sequestered in the safety of their homeland, as dangerous as that was for Jesus and his disciples. So in a sense, Jesus and his disciples, they're being buffeted from both sides. In the mainstream of their Jewish culture, Jesus is misunderstood. His death is being plotted. 
And so he takes his disciples to the very edge of their comfort zone, both spiritually and geographically. And he takes them to a place of great paganism because he knows that this conversation and how they answer his questions will determine not only what the disciples do within their own people, the Jewish nation, but what happens in the great and wider world. So do not, in verse 13, gloss over the physical location of where this conversation takes place. And so Jesus, in verse 13, asks a relatively benign question. Who do other people say that I am? Now think about it. That's a relatively easy question to answer. All you're asked to do when you're asked that question is just to report and to deliver news and information. And that's exactly what the disciples do. When Jesus asks, who do people say that I am? They say, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah. All of these people that they thought would be forerunners to the Messiah. John the Baptist had already been crucified. Some people thought that this Jesus was John the Baptist reincarnated. Old Testament prophecies seem to suggest that, that a figure such as Elijah or Jeremiah would come back as a forerunner to the Messiah. So they acknowledged that Jesus was special, that Jesus was unique, but the people were not claiming that he was the Messiah himself. And so they, the disciples, have no problem telling Jesus what other people are saying about him. Now, look at verse 15. Here is the crux of the conversation. Here is the question that not only puts the disciples on the spot, it puts you on the spot as well. Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Now, let's compare the answers in verse 14 with the answer in verse 16. All right? First question is in verse 13. Who do others say I am? And the disciples, verse 14, a plurality of disciples, at least two, because it says they replied, they hold their hands up and they answer. Verse 15, the question's a little bit more personal. It's a little bit more direct. And the answer in verse 16 notes that only one person answers the question. In verse 14, at least two are willing to give the easy answer, but in verse 16, only one, only one is willing to take a stand. And what you know, it's Simon Peter. And what does he say? He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Interesting, because in verse 13, Jesus uses the phrase, who do people say the Son of Man is? Son of man, the essence of humanity. People could accept that Jesus was fully human, but here Peter says you are not only fully human, he does not deny the title son of man, but he says you are son of man and you are son of God. This is a claim that the disciples heretofore had not made. This was the first time that Jesus heard unequivocally that his followers understood him to be more than just a righteous teacher, more than just a miracle worker, more than a wonderful example, but the very essence of God himself in human bodily form. How do you think that made Jesus feel? Well, look at the next verse. It's as if Jesus gives Peter an attaboy. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Yes, thank you. Finally, these people, they get it, Jesus is saying. For those of you that are parents, you know that what comes out of the mouths of your children has the power to send you over the edge or to the heights of ecstasy. My daughter complicated our lives before she was even born. She chose to come into this world two months early. She was due the end of February. 
She chose to make her appearance the week before Christmas. That makes Christmas a little more complicated in some ways. And so a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to Elizabeth and I said, sweetheart, what do you want to do for your birthday? Where do you want to go? She's turning seven. And she says, you know, daddy, why not? Can I just have a few of my friends from school over to my house to play in my room and I'm thinking of all the money we're saving. I'm like, sure, honey, add a girl, that's great. And then I said, well, sweetheart, what would you like for your birthday? And she said, you know, daddy, gosh, I don't know. Whatever you get me, I'll love it. And I thought, man, that's incredible. Did I teach her this? No, that cannot be my daughter. But I said to her, to my mind, and to my wife, blessed are you, Elizabeth. For in that moment, she was teaching us something about contentment and something about whatever, I have enough. And so I wonder if Jesus kind of felt this way when, when Peter, who he had been pouring into for years, finally was able to articulate this confession. Now, this is good news for us in verse 17. He not only calls Simon blessed, but he says, this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Now, this phrase is an incredible encouragement to me. You know, for those of us who grew up Baptist, we do not talk about the Holy Spirit probably as much as we should. But do you understand and do you realize that if you were ever able to comprehend anything of the nature and power of God, that is not your own ability to understand that on your own power. In real time, right here, right now, if you were able to understand what I am saying, if it makes any spiritual sense to you whatsoever, do you realize that that is the Holy Spirit of God himself in real time opening your mind to the power of the scripture. The Holy Spirit is not merely uh, a static experience that a select few get, not at all. The Holy Spirit for people who call him Lord and Savior, it is for all of us. And if you are able to comprehend what's going on in this story, that is proof that the Holy Spirit is real, alive, and speaking to your heart right this very minute. And when you understand that, and when you live in that, God doesn't seem nearly as distant as you sometimes think He is. So understand that the Holy Spirit is real and active in your life as we speak. We just have to learn how to recognize it. Verse 18 and 19, and I tell you that you are Peter. He gives Simon a new name and a new identity. Do you know what the word Peter means? It means a pebble. Petros. That's where we get the word petroleum. Things that come out of a rock like oil. And so Simon is given this new name Peter to signify a pebble and Peter says excuse me and Jesus says to Peter you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church now there are many different interpretations of this verse who is Jesus referring to or what is Jesus referring to when he then says and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not overcome it there are some Christians who think that Jesus said that and he pointed to Peter being the rock and that Peter is the foundation of the church, the first leader of the church. But in the Protestant tradition, we do not teach that. We seem to say, no, Jesus, when he said on this rock, was referring to that confession of faith and the reality that Jesus himself is the foundation of his church. And Peter, who he later refers to as a living stone is one of the pebbles and if you call Jesus the Christ yourself then you are also one of these living stones you are one of these pebbles as the church is built up and do you notice here that Jesus says I will build my church not the church not a church the church my church 
Jesus says. This is the first time in Scripture that the word church is used. It means a gathering of called out ones. This is where the church starts. Who knows, had this conversation not taken place, how this would have changed church history. And maybe you and I would have gotten here some other way. But this is where the church begins. This is the first time that Jesus uses the word church and he calls it his own. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You know, gates are not offensive weapons. What do gates do? Yes, they protect, but they also can imprison and they can enslave. And so what Jesus is saying, all the power of Satan and his demons cannot keep the gospel message from penetrating the darkest heart. Later, Paul talks about death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is thy sting? That death has no power to separate you from the love of God. Death has no power to separate the church from the wonder-working power of God. And that is exciting. And look at verse 19. He's talking to Peter and to the disciples. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Hey, folks, what do keys do? They open things. They give you access. What was once unavailable to you becomes available to you. Listen, I locked my keys in the office one day. At that moment, who was the most important person in my life? The person with the master key. And my whole life was on hold until I could find the person with the master key. So not only is it important that keys give us access, but that we hold those keys. Folks, we have the power, not because of our own merit, But we have the power to introduce people to Jesus. Do you understand what a huge responsibility and privilege that is? And do you know that the quality of our faith and the quality of our obedience has eternal consequences in the lives of others? And that is why he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We don't determine what happens in heaven. But somehow, some way... The level and the measure of our faithfulness determines in large part whether people hear the gospel or they don't. And that has eternal consequences. Now, the story goes on. It says in verse 21, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Look at verse 22. Now here is Peter, just a few verses ago, who is the hero. Now what happens in verse 22 and 23? As Jesus describes what kind of Messiah he's going to be and what's going to happen, Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. What a change in a way from verse 16. Now look at verse 23. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. In a matter of verses, Peter goes from a hero to a zero. Here's what is refreshingly hopeful as I read this conversation, as I put my own life into this conversation. Jesus loves you so much that he is going to call it like he sees it when he looks at your life. Jesus does not have to whitewash. Jesus does not have to sugarcoat. Jesus tells you exactly where you're at at any given moment in your relationship with him. And the good news is, no matter how bad it is, he keeps talking to you. And he keeps having the conversation. And the dialogue continues. And so here you have Simon who starts out the chapter being given this new name, Peter, rock, building block, cornerstone, part of the foundation of the very church. 
told along with the disciples that he's been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the keys of access such as prayer and interpreting the Bible and to be able to say this is what the Bible says, to have the authority that says this is what it means to be a Christian. That's what it talks about when it says keys and authority and binding and loosing, the ability to interpret, the ability to explain, the ability to invite people to follow Jesus. Who gives us the authority to do that? Who tells us to do that? Who says that Jesus' word can be trusted when we do that? It is this confession itself. Now, Peter, in just a few short verses, is called the adversary and is told to step aside. Sound like your life? Does it sound like the conversation that you sometimes have with Jesus, that there are times when you know in all humility that God looks down on you with eyes of love and says, Atta girl, that's my boy. You gave me great glory by making that wise choice and that sacrificial decision. But there are other times, are there not, when he looks at me and you and he says, if that's what you're going to say, if that's what you're going to believe, would you please do me a favor and would you please step aside so that my kingdom and my work can go forward? Because right now, you are in the way. But he still keeps talking. And you know this is not the end of the story, right? This did not disqualify Peter for a lifetime of incredible service. God in his mercy uses us again and again and again. And then finally in verse 24, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Those words must have resonated in the disciples' minds as they looked back after he had ascended into heaven. And they said, do you remember when Jesus said, take up his cross? That's what he did for us. And so for you, how's your conversation with Jesus going today? What have you guys been talking about during the holidays? What's he telling you about the new year? What's he calling you? What name is he giving you today? Beloved? Friend? Son? Daughter? Those things are unchanging, but maybe he's also adding some names. Disloyal? Forgetful? Lukewarm? He's going to call it like he sees it. If you don't know him today, he's calling you too. Come and be mine. He's wooing you. He's courting you. The spirit is alive in this place. He's saying something to you. Can you hear it? In the year 248, there was a man named Cyprian. He was a bishop in Carthage, which is now in modern-day Libya. And he wrote a letter to his friend Donatus about these new people called Christians. Here's what he writes. This seems to me, Donatus, to be a cheerful world when I view it from this fair garden under the shadow of these vines. But if I climb some great mountain and look out over the wide lands, you know very well what I would see. Thieves on the road, pirates on the seas, in the amphitheaters, men murdering each other to please the applauding crowds, and under all roofs I see misery and selfishness. It really is, Donatus, a bad world. An incredibly bad world. Yet in the midst of it, I have found a quiet and holy people. They have discovered a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of this sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. 
They have overcome the world. These people, Donatus, are the Christians. And I am one of them. That was Peter's confession. You are the Christ. Is that your confession? And if so, do you believe it to the point where you will deny yourself and you will take up your cross and you will follow him for the sake of his church, knowing full well that the gates of hell cannot overcome it? Would you pray with me? Dear and gracious Father, on this snowy day, for those of us who know you, our hearts can be warmed. Many of us have had a conversation with you for years, and it's good, and it's rich, and it's wonderful. There are others of us, we know you, Father, but in your honesty with us, you call it like it is, and, and we need to recommit. And there are those of us, Father, who are just beginning to hear your voice. Wherever we are at, keep talking. For we know you are not only the hope for the world, but you are our only hope. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's in that holy name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing a song that echoes this conversation.
decision you need to make today to continue the conversation. Maybe it's to come and be a part of this body of believers, this church that belongs to Christ as we overcome the gates of darkness and injustice and homelessness and lostness. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Him. Maybe you need for the first time to make that declaration that Peter made in Caesarea Philippi 2,000 years ago when you say you are the Christ. Or maybe you just want to come and help us understand where you at and we'll walk with you as you start your conversation with Jesus. I will be in the parlor. God is here. The power of Christ is in you. The Spirit of Christ is real and if you know Him, is speaking to you all the time. Do you listen? Do you hear Him? What is He saying to you? Go in peace and go with God. Drive safe, be careful, love each other, love the world as we proclaim this hope. As the piano continues to play, you're dismissed. I'll see you in the parlor.